Thank you, Kate, for the nice introduction. I also want to thank the organizers of this uh, series on machine learning theory uh, for inviting me, and I hope they will forgive me if I don't talk about machine learning theory. I decided um, I wanted to talk about the foundations of mathematics. So um, this is the question that I'm going to use as a motivation. So everybody's familiar with Alpha Zero. Everyone knows that Alpha Zero can learn to play Go, chess, and shogi at a superhuman level given nothing but the rules of the game by self-play. So various people have asked the question, could the same thing be done for mathematics? Could, is it conceivable that one could build someday, you know, maybe in the next 10 years, a math zero that learns to do mathematics at a superhuman level given nothing but the rules of the game? So this talk is going to use this as a motivation for thinking about uh, what is the mathematics game? So this is a deep, fascinating philosophical question for me. Um, so presumably, this involves some formal foundation, some set of rules, and an objective. Now, I think it's natural for mathematicians uh, to think about the classification problem as uh, sort of a one of, if not the driving forces in mathematics. Um, mathematics is full of concepts. Each concept comes with a notion of isomorphism and we're interested in classifying the instances of that concept up to isomorphism. Um, so a, a trivial example, or a first example is that the natural numbers arise as the classification of finite sets. Um, now, really what this talk is going to be about is incorporating isomorphism into the foundations of mathematics. Um, and the idea is that if we're going to uh, have a formal system that defines the rules and take as an objective to the, something that the system should work on, the classification problem, then it has to have a thorough understanding of isomorphism. And I'm interested in, and have been for a while in the issue of incorporating isomorphism into the foundations of mathematics. And in any case, isomorphism seems central to uh, the structure of mathematics. Now, um, I don't know how many people in this audience have encountered homotopy type theory. So that's a natural thing people um, will connect this to. Um, if we have time, I'll discuss that at the end. But um, you'll see where I'm going in a moment. Um, okay, this is just to emphasize the importance of isomorphism in the structure of mathematics. So as I said before, every concept has uh, an, an associated notion of isomorphism and symmetry is a special case where we have an isomorphism of an object with itself. That's an automorphism, a symmetry. And this gets tied up with the notion of natural or canonical objects. So there's no canonical point on a geometric circle. There's always a rotation that maps any point to the other. There's no canonical basis for a vector space, no canonical isomorphism between a vector space and its dual. These are all issues of symmetry. And symmetry is fundamentally about isomorphism. OK, so. Um, for people complete, you know, for, for fairly naive regular folk, um, they understand isomorphism. Uh, you know, people understand immediately what it means for two graphs to be isomorphic. Um, and we say that isomorphic graphs are the same. And isomorphic graphs have the same graph theoretic properties. And a lot of people um, would say, well, this is tautological in some sense because what they mean by a graph theoretical property is that it respects graph isomorphism. It has the same value, true or false, on isomorphic graphs. But this tautological view of isomorphism overlooks something that I think is very important in the foundations of mathematics. And that is that this property of respecting isomorphism can be enforced by grammatical syntactic constraints on the language we use. And that's what this talk is, is really about. It's about um, understanding 
uh, the syntactic constraints that guarantee that things respect, that statements respect isomorphism and understanding isomorphism in the general setting. Um, I think the easiest way for people to ask questions is just wait for me to pause at some transition and speak up. And I would be um, much more comfortable if we can make this as interactive as possible. Now, I'm an AI person. I've worked in a lot of different areas, but everything is, has always been, in my opinion, in the service of AI. Um, and when I say type theory is really an issue in AI, not many people resonate with that. The AI community um, has sort of given up on logicism. Logicism was, you know, the backbone of AI in the beginning, John McCarthy and uh, so on. Um, but nonetheless, I view type theory as a kind of cognitive science. Boyavatsky used to say that he got interested in type theory and he used to say, well, type theory is what mathematicians have been doing all along. And I resonate with that really strongly. Math mathematical language, human mathematical language, uh, respects uh, well-formedness. For example, it feels wrong to ask about the members of a point in a topological space or the members of the number five, or it feels wrong to ask whether a vector in a vector space is equal to the identity element of the field. Um, mathematicians have a sense of grammar. And the question is, can we understand the sense of grammar that mathematicians are already using and understand how that interacts with isomorphism and how that facilitates uh, maybe reasoning? Um, and also, I believe that, that if we really understand the grammar of mathematical language, there must be some relationship between that grammar and the grammar of language more generally, because it is sort of a grammar that's uh, supporting efficient reasoning. And, and I just have to believe that will transfer. Okay. No question. So no discussion of type theory can go without talking about Martin Loft type theory. So Martin Loft type theory uh, is capable of expressing general statements and proofs about mathematics while placing very strong grammatical constraints on the expressions being used. Um, but I'm going to sort of deviate from Martin Loft type theory. So and not only am I sort of uh, in a realm that AI people don't really uh, appreciate. I'm also in a realm that the type theorists are very unhappy with because I'm going to um, not, I'm going to deviate from ML, Martin Loft type theory. So Martin Loft type theory um, was developed historically to represent constructive mathematics. It sort of descended from Brouwer's uh, constructive mathematics program. And in my opinion, a lot of the features of that language are sort of um, bear the marks of that historical development. And there's still a lot of people in the type theory community who, for whom it's important to accommodate constructive mathematics. So I just want to briefly mention some of these things. So <clears throat> they represent propositions by types. So instead of just writing down ordinary first order predicate calculus like formulas, every proposition is represented by a type. It distinguishes um, propositional from definitional equality. There are these two notions of equality. And it's kind of confusing as to what they are. Um, and there's, they represent equality with this um, very, in my opinion, complicated axiom or induction rule J. Um, and Martin Loft type theory is also um, typically presented as inference rules. The, the, the community is very proof theoretic. So they're very interested in the inference rules without, um, specif without a, specifying a clear semantics. Okay, so what am I going to try to talk about here? I'm going to try to talk about um, set theoretic type theory. So uh, I was talking to some, um, some people in the type theory community and they, they said, well, look, from the beginning, we always knew that there was a set theoretic meaning, a set theoretic interpretation. Um, but uh, type theorists 
typically sort of think of type theory as an alternative or in opposition to set theory. So they've always sort of eschewed the, the set theoretic formulation. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna formulate a version of set theoretic type theory with transparent set theoretic semantics, Boolean propositions, and set theoretic equality. So I'm trying to mimic the language that mathematicians use naturally to talk about uh, concepts that are ultimately defined in terms of set theory. Um, and I'm also gonna give uh, what I think, as far as I know, is the first complete system of inference rules for isomorphism in this setting, independent type theory with set theoretic propositional equality. Okay, so um, it also wouldn't be right to talk about set theoretic uh, type theory and set, and set theoretic isomorphism without talking about Bourbaki isomorphism. So in the 1930s, Bourbaki in the, in the series of books defined the notion of structure in a very general way, or fairly general way, and defined the notion of isomorphism uh, for structures. So if we interpret this in type theory, what, what Burbach, he did is he defined a class of types, uh, which you can actually formalize as type expressions in, in type theory. Um, and for example, the, the type of groups, the class of groups is defined by a type expression. Uh, and in, in the type theory, in general type theory, in Martin, if you compare it with Martin Loft type theory, uh, the Bourbaki structural types, structure types are a special case. They're restricted to have all of their set variables declared at the top level. Um, and these set variables are called carrier sets. Um, most familiar structures, such as groups or topological spaces um, or fields, have only a single carrier set. And um, I'm just going to talk about this very briefly. Everyone should be familiar with the standard definitions of isomorphism. Um, you, could, you should be able, and you should be able to take a new kind of structure and intuitively be able to define isomorphism for that structure. Um, so just to, be, just to say a little bit, um, in addition to the carrier sets, a structure type specifies additional structure, functions, predicates, constants, and two uh, structures are isomorphic if there's a system of bijection between their carrier sets, in general, you want to handle more than one carrier set um, that, that identifies their structure. And I think probably everyone is familiar with standard notions of isomorphism. So I'm not going to go through that uh, in detail. Isomorphism congruence. This is what this talk is um, really about. Um, Isomorphic congruence, I'm going to formulate it as a kind of inference principle that says that isomorphic objects are intersubstitutable in well-formed contexts. That as long as you are respecting the grammatical constraints of natural mathematical language, um, any context, if you can take any context and substitute isomorphic objects into that context, and you're going to get isomorphic results. Every context respects isomorphism. So I'm going to call this isomorphism congruence, the intersubstitutability inter of isomorphic objects. Um, and the main thing we're going to show is that you can, you can sort of capture isomorphism with two inference rules, one that expresses the Bourbaki notion of isomorphism, and the other, which is just a statement of isomorphism congruence, that isomorphic objects are intersubstitutable. Um, and the main technical difficulty is proving isomorphism congruence. So I'm going to sort of orbit around this, um, gradually becoming more formal and more precise. Um, OK, so. Uh, this is where things get trivial. Part of the complaint, I think part of the discomfort that type theorists have with what I'm about to do is that it's too simple. It's too sort of trivial. 
What I'm going to do now is go through the constructs of the language. So it's a formal system. So it's going to have a nice finite um, closed set of constructs. And they're each, what I'm going to do is assign each to tell you what they mean, right? So there's going to be a constant set, which is, which is a class. It's the class of all sets. Some people can get philosophically uh, concerned with exactly what is the class of all sets, but let's put that on hold. Mathematicians have no trouble saying a group is a set together with. Um, uh, there's a constant bool, which is just the truth values. You can construct a pair. If, you, if S and U are well-formed expressions, you can construct their pair. The meaning of that is just going to be the pair. Um, and if I've got a pair E, I can take its first component and its second component. And the meaning of that is just going to be exactly what I just said. Mathematicians don't typically use lambda expressions, but computer scientists do. So um, I can write a lambda expression to denote a function. The lambda expression, um, lambda x of type tau e of x, uh, is the function that will map an element x of tau to the value of e of x. And, and that's going to be the meaning, a uh, set theoretic function. Um, uh, an application is, you know, the f is in an application, f is going to denote a function, e is going to denote an argument that has to be in, in the domain of that function, and f of e is just the application. We have Boolean formulas. We can apply a predicate to something. Um, in the domain of the predicate. That's just a special case of an application. We can have equality. In this system, equality is going to be set theoretic equality. Those, that's going to be true if those are set theoretically equal. Um, uh, we can have a universally quantified formula. That's going to be true if for all x in the type s, b of x is true, just like first order predicate calculus. We also have Boolean connectives, which are gonna have their Boolean meaning. So this whole, this whole slide is intentionally trivial. And that's considered, I consider that to be a really good thing. The, the semantics is on, you know, you're wearing the semantics on the sleeve. It's transparent semantics. Um, okay, this, these are, there are three more constructs in the language um, which are not as familiar. So the first is a dependent function type. So this pi expression is a function type. It's going to be the type of functions, such as a function that type takes x of type tau, and its value has to be of type sigma of x. And if, if sigma doesn't depend on tau, then we just write this as tau arrow sigma. Now, in Martin Loft type theory, if you're um, in Martin Loft type theory, Propositions are represented by types. And this dependent function type is used to represent universal quantification. That's not being done here. Here we have universal quantification in its natural, what I consider to be natural meaning. If you're not using this for universal quantification, it's not so important. It's not as important in this system. Typically, you can get away with just the arrow types. Okay, that's, that's dependent function types. Now we have dependent pair types. This uh, is really- Quick important. question. Why question. did you have, why couldn't you just use it, denote it as usual math notation that's a function from this to that? Well, that's here, right? Is this what you mean, tau to- Oh, sigma? yeah, 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 sure. Okay, yeah, sorry. That's if, um, that's if X does not appear in sigma. So an example of a function like this might be a function on the natural numbers that always returns a number greater than its argument. So you could say greater than its argument there. Um, so, uh, okay, th this is a dependent pair type. This is really important. This, the um, Bourbaki, remember a Bourbaki uh, structure type says there's a carrier set with structure. I can use this, so, so a group, a group consists of a set and a group operation and axioms that say that inverses and identity elements exist. So a group can be viewed as a pair of a set and an operation, a binary operation on that set. I can express the type group, I'll put that on the next slide, by as a dependent pair type. This is the type whose elements are a pair of x in type tau 
And uh, the second element has to be in a type that can depend on the value of x. So this could say a set of pairs where x is a set and the second component is a, is a binary operation on that set. And then I would get the type magma. Um, so this thing is what's going to give us classes, the, the class of groups or the, or the class of fields or whatever. Um, but it, so, so let me define it to, again, just in complete generality. This type is the set of pairs such that the first component is in tau and the second component is in this type that can depend on the value of the first component. And if, just like this has a simple notation, if this does not depend on x, then you can just write it as tau cross sigma, the set of pairs in tau cross sigma. Okay, there's one more construct that's not typically in Martin-Loft type theory, but I'm gonna rely on heavily here, and that is a subtype. So this, is the, so this, S exp this expression is gonna denote the subtype of tau such that phi of x is true. Okay, that's, so that's also very simple. Um, it just, this is like comprehension in, in set theory. Um, so here's the type group. Uh, group is, is a pair of a set and, a, and an operation, but I'm going to use this uh, subtype operator to say that this operation has to satisfy axioms involving the set and the function. So these would be the axioms that define group. And I've given myself enough expressive power in the formulas to write all the standard things I want to write here. Um, so I can write the axioms that state, uh, that state the properties of a group. Okay, I'm going to try to um, push on your intuitions. So I'm going to give some examples and push on intuitions. Let's look at this type. Uh, I'm writing this type, you know, in this notation. So this, one, uh, this is the type of uh, triples where S is a set, W is a set, and the last component is a function from S to W. So think of this as having two carrier sets uh, and a function between them. And the question is, this is a class. I wanna consider the classification problem for this class. When are two of these isomorphic and what are the isomorphic classes? What are the, the up to isomorphism, what's in this class? So this function for each W is going to have some number of S's that map to it. So each element of W is gonna have a count. How many, how many times is it hit by this map? And I'm gonna claim that two of these are isomorphic so first of all, I'm gonna sort of apply the notion of isomorphism. Two of these should be isomorphic if there's a bijection between this, the first S and the second S and the first W and the second W that identifies them. And the claim is that, that two of these are isomorphic uh, if they have the same histogram of counts, the same number of things that have zero count, the same number of things that have one count, the same number of things that have two count. Um, so we get these count histograms as the, as a, from the classification problem of this type. All right, suppose I leave W as a free variable. So now W is a free variable of the type expression. What's the, so now I'm pushing on intuitions. What's the uh, classification problem give for this? What are the isomorphism classes of this? Each element of W still has a count. How many times is it hit by S? So, um, um, so the idea is that this is going to be a bag of Ws. For any W, I can ask how many times is it hit? How many times does it occur? So the, ISO, so the classification problem for this yields the concept of multiset or the concept of bag. Um, and whenever I see that concept, I'm like, you know, this is the right way to approach that concept. But anyway. Okay. Um, I'm sort of circling around, gradually becoming more formal. Um, the set class distinction. Anybody who's had any exposure to category theory 
is familiar with the set class distinction. The category of groups um, is too large to be a set. It's not a set, it's a class, a proper class. In the type system that I'm going to develop, um, there's going to be a syntactic distinction between class expressions and set expressions. And this corresponds to something called the universe level in Martin Law of type theory. Um, so you can look at an expression and tell whether it's uh, class level or set level. Um, and it's sort of easy to define an expression is set level if the constant set does not appear in the expression outside of Boolean expressions. If it's inside a Boolean, the Boolean thing just has a truth value. So it's not going to blow the thing up to be class size. Um, but so this distinction, we're going to have a syntactic distinction between set level and class level. And in this system, I'm going, I'm going to stick very close to set theory. And when I do that, all the variables are going to be set level. All va variable values are set level. You have the type group, the class group as a class, but if I say let G be a group, G is in the universe of sets. G is set level. The, an individual group is set level. Um, okay, so I said um, I'm going to argue that there are two inference rules that you can put into the foundation that capture this general universal notion of isomorphism. Um, this, this universal notion of isomorphism is going to cover all the class expressions that you can write in this language that are well formed. Um, so first I'm going to be explicit about what I mean by a Bourbaki structure type. So a Bourbaki structure type has this form. It has some prefix of carrier sets followed by a type that has to be a set. This has to be a set level type. So Typically, if you're typically this is would be built out of um, these sets together with function space arrow and cross products. That would be a simple type. If you're a computer scientist, that would be a simple type. Here, in the, I should mention that this is a is a paper by the title of this talk that just went up on archive, <clears throat> and that paper um, has a lot of the details that I'm going to gloss over here. Um, just to point out that not, um, not every type in this language has this form. This is a special kind of type where all the set variables have been moved to the top level, have been moved into this prefix. Just to give you an example of a type that's not of this form, um, I'm, I can write down this group with action type. So I'm going to say, cons consider a triple of a group, a set, and a function from the group to functions from the set to the set. The, so this function is giving the group action. And then I can write axioms that says that the function is a group, ax, ac, uh, group action on G, on G and S. So what makes this not a structure type is that this is not set, right? That's group. So we need to generalize the notion of isomorphism to all, all the uh, type expressions. Okay, the, I said the, the issue here is understanding, one of the things that I'm very interested in is understanding, having a formal theory of the grammar that mathematicians actually, actually use. Mathematicians, I think, have a strong sense of what is sensible, and sensible really means that you're respecting isomorphism, I would try to argue. Um, so we want to be very careful about well-formedness. Well-formedness is what we're after. Here. Um, well, formedness is relative to a context declaring types for variables and stating assumptions. So, this is very natural in human mathematical discourse. Eric Grimson once told me that his introduction to MIT as a graduate student was to walk into a class and the instructor walked in, and instead of saying, Hello, how are you? Welcome to the class, the instructor walked in and said, Let B be a Banach space. Um, and he's declaring a variable, B, over the, Bonach, over the tight Banach space. So the idea is that in human mathematical discourse, we have the set of things which we've declared a set of variables. 
and we and we're making assumptions about those variables, making statements of claim, you know, making assumptions or claims. We're writing formulas in terms of those variables. So we have to be careful. I want to, and I'm trying to understand that grammar. What is the grammar that we use when we do that? So I'm going to talk about um, what does it mean to be a well-formed context, a discourse context, you know, setting up what the variables are and what the assumptions are. So the empty context is well-formed. That just gives us a base case. And then I'm going to say if gamma is well-formed and I declare uh, x to be sigma, it better be true that sig the type sigma is also well formed in the context gamma. So well formedness is going to be relative to a discourse context, relative to a declaration of the types and the variables, of the, uh, declaration of the variables and the assumptions being made. So if this is well, if sigma is well formed, then this context is well formed and declares X to be of type sigma. Now, um, I, we can also make assumptions. So if gamma is well-formed and phi is a well-formed Boolean expression, then I can extend gamma with phi. So, and, uh, and this makes the assumption phi. So the idea is that any well-formed context, for any well-formed context, that context is specifying the set of allowed variable interpretations. If I say, let B be a Banach space, the variable B has to denote a Banach space. Um, if I make some assumptions, I'm can only considering variable interpretations that satisfy those assumptions. Again, it's trivial. I love being trivial because I'm trying to understand, you know, the, the, what our language, the language we use, is formally. Um, I should also say that this is, of course, also part of Martin Loft type theory. Martin Loft type theory has context just like this, except they don't have Boolean formulas. They just use declarations. Um, entailment. Tarski. Arguably, Tarski's um, greatest legacy in mathematical logic is the definition of truth. Um, it was a really significant advance to have a formal understanding of semantics. If you take a course in logic, you'll study first order predicate calculus, and you'll study, you'll be um, given a semantic value function, a Tarski and compositional semantics that assigns a meaning to every expression rel relative to some model, some first order structure. That definition of meaning was Tarski's big, was, was a major contribution of Tarski. Um, if you take that course in first order logic, you'll learn what it means for a formula to be valid. It means it's true in all models. Um, and then you have the inference rules. And in first order logic, the inference rules prove all and only the valid formulas. They're complete, they're sound and complete. Um, but then there's Gödel's incompleteness theorem that, you know, for arithmetic, for the true formulas of the particular structure of arithmetic, those are not recursively enumerable. There's no uh, proof system that will uh, capture the truths of arithmetic. Nonetheless, if you're a Platonist, you believe that each closed formula of arithmetic has a truth value. Um, I certainly believe that. Um, uh, I've talked to constructivists who get very upset about Platonism and Gödel. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is write down uh, compositional semantic value functions. Um, well, I will do that eventually. But the idea is that this double turnstile means implies. So we're going to have that the, the context gamma defines a set of variable interpretations. This is going to mean, this sequent or entailment is going to mean that for every variable interpretation satisfying gamma, the value of E under that variable interpretation is an element of the value of sigma under that interpretation. Again, I'm trying to be fairly trivial. Um, so examples, if S is a set and X is an element of S and F is a function from S to S, then F of X is a set. Um, under the same 
uh, context, we get that f of x equals x is Boolean. I don't know whether it's true or false, but it's a well-formed Boolean. Um, we can also make assumptions. So um, we write this, that gamma entails some formula. If the formula is well-formed, this is going to require, for gamma to imply phi is of type Bool, it's going to require that this is well-formed. Um, and we can write down a sequence that says, for example, if S is a set, X is an S, F is a function from S to S, Y is an S, and X equals Y. If X equals Y, then F of X equals F of Y. So we can write entailments. Um, I would love to get questions. I would probably be okay if everything's still trivial. Um, Kurbach key isomorphism. I said we're gonna have two inference rules. Two inference rules are going to capture uh, isomorphism in this model. This one's the first one, Moore-Bakke. So this, this is a, a slight generalization of the 1930s definition in the Moore-Bakke textbook. So I'm going to take, I'm going to assume that um, I'm defining a class of structures by a, a sequence of carrier sets. I'm allowing myself to have any number of carrier sets, followed by a set expression that's giving the type, that's giving the structure. So, you know, an example would be where I have a group and this would be the type of binary operations on this a, a set and this would be the type of binary operations on that set. And then the inference rule is going to be um, if U and V are both instances of this Bourbaki structure type, then they're going to be isomorphic if and only if there exists a system of bijections where each bijection is mapping um, U's interpretation of one of these sets uh, to V's interpretation of one of these sets. Remember that U and V now are going to be tuples that actually contain particular sets. So I've got the sets in U, the carrier sets in U, and the carrier sets in V, and they're isomorphic if there exists a series of bijections between the corresponding carrier sets that carries the structure. And um, I think, you know, mathematicians can easily write down what it means to carry the structure. You write a commutative diagram or you write some algebraic equations. I'm not going to belabor what it means to carry the structure. The point, however, is that the formula, you can write as a formula, the, um, the, the property of carrying the structure in the base language. You don't need to, to refer to isomorphism or anything outside of the language. The definition of, of isomorphism for groups or for topologies or for graphs can be written down in a formula of the base language. And so this rule says they're going to be isomorphic if a formula in the base language is true. And I've, I've, in the paper, um, you'll find this um, explicit specification of the formula for what it means to carry the structure. Um, and this is generalized to handle the dependent structure, the fact that the type, the set expression does not have to be a simple type. So it's a slight generalization. So here's the, here's the inference rule for isomorphism congruence. This is, um, uh, this is just writing it down explicitly. So what's going on here? This is saying if I have a context and I declare a variable to be of type sigma. So suppose I declare a variable to be a group. And then I, def or let's, let's say a topological space. I declare X to be a topological space. And then I have some expression in terms of X that's of some other type, like it might be group. Right, so if X is a topological space, then E of X is a group. And I have two isomorphic topological spaces. Then whatever this group is, it has to be group isomorphic to that group. So this is saying that if all I know, if this is well formed, when all I know about X is that it's a, a group, that it's a sigma, if this is well formed, and if I have two isomorphic ones, then this, you, this thing applied to you has to be isomorphic to this thing applied to B. And that's what I'm going to mean by isomorphism congruence. Um, 
Now, the truth of this, the validity of this inference rule under the semantics, under the trivial set theoretic semantics, is very sensitive to the syntactic constraints we place on the language. So, I, you know, in some sense, this all should have been done in 1930. Bur Bourbaki should have done this, right? The, um, but it, it sort of requires, or the logicians should have done this. Um, um, a particular this okay so this is the this is the key um, syntactic constraint that makes it work the key syntactic constraint that that allow that makes substitution of isomorphics valid is the restriction on equality um, so equality in order for equality to be well formed this is probably the thing that was the hardest to see for equality to be well formed, you require that the equality between U and V to be well formed, you require that there exists a set. This has to be set level. There exists a set level expression such that your discourse context implies that they're both in that same set. And if you put that restriction on the equality being well formed, then the equality is going to respect isomorphism. Okay, so let's give a counter example. I just want to, under I want to understand what goes wrong without this restriction. In set theory, naked set theory, ZFC set theory, you can write all kinds of things that violate isomorphism. All the implementations are exposed. But let's do it, let's do it in type theory. So if I say S is a set and X is an S, and P is of this type. Okay, what is this type? This is the type of pointed sets. So this is a type of pairs. The first element is a set, and the second element is a point in that set. This is the type of pointed sets. It's a super simple type. Um, so, uh, so suppose I, I take this context and I write the equality that the point in the pointed set, so P2 is taking the point out of that pointed set. And, and I wanna know, is the point in this pointed set the same as that X? Now what happens is I can have two pointed sets that are isomorphic. What it means to be isomorphic for pointed sets is just that um, the two sets are the same size. Right, because there's always, if the two sets are the same size, there's always a bijection between the sets that identifies the two points. Um, so there's a pointed set that makes this true and an isomorphic pointed set that makes it false. But note that there's no set expression that, that under all interpretations of this context contains both X and the point of P. So this equality is blocked. Okay, there's also an issue with function types. Um, we, for some simplicity in this system, I've restricted all function types, all function spaces to be set level. So if I have... Uh, David, can I ask a question? Great. Um, yeah, I'm confused about this notion of isomorphism. You said any two sets of the same size are isomorphic? No, any two, but... any two pointed sets, if the structure is just just a single element of the set. Oh, I see. Singleton sets. No, no, no. Um, a set together with a point from the set. Okay, I see. A pair of a set and a point from the set. Yes. It's, all, it's almost the simplest possible non trip I mean, it, it is kind of trivial. Um, yeah. I mean, two of those are going to be isomorphic if there's a bijection between the sets. Because if there's a bijection between the sets, there's always a bijection that carries the point of one to the point of the other. Okay. If that, yeah. Um, function spaces. So what can go wrong with function spaces? Let me just say, point out what can go wrong. Consider the function space group arrow bool. And suppose I take a naive meaning for that function space, meaning any function from group to bool. And then I consider the, the discourse context 
let P be a function, a predicate on groups. It's group to bool, so it's a predicate on groups. So, um, and then I consider a group, and then I say, oh, well, P is a predicate on groups, so P of G is bool. I didn't force P to respect group isomorphism. So now P can be true on one group and false on an isomorphic group. And that's going to violate uh, uh, substitution of isomorphism. It's going to violate isomorphism congruence. So um, we have to be very careful with this group arrow bool. Um, and in the, in the paper, I just take all function, I just disallow this. I just take all function spaces to be Boolean, I mean, uh, to be set level. This is, this is not set level. You're okay, it's gonna, you're gonna be okay with set level function spaces. Sorry, um, I, I, I didn't understand that. I thought bool refers to zero one or what is it? Yes, correct. But the that's a set. Rate, and that's a set. Group, however, is a class. So the domain of P is a class. So P with a class size domain is not, P is not set level. Does that, does that make sense? I see. It has a, it has a class size domain. It's a, it's a predicate in a class. Um, so wait, what was your, what was the problem and what was the fix? I don't understand. Okay, so the problem is that if I give this a naive semantics, if I say group to um, bool naively, um, then this predicate, if this can be any predicate at all, then it can be true on one group and false on an isomorphic group. So what that means, and that's gonna violate, so my, my um, isomorphism congruence is going to insist that for any formula involving a group variable, if I substitute that group, if I substitute the group with an isomorphic group, it has to be the same truth value. But if P is allowed to distinguish between isomorphic groups, then the group congruent, then the isomorphism congruence fails. Is that? If P can tell and, and, and what was your fix? So the fix is to not allow class size domains. I see. And, okay. And it's not obvious why that, it's not obvious at, at this point why that fixes the problem, but it does. Um, things just work for um, uh, set sized function spaces. And we'll, if we have time, we'll see more of that. Uh, but I just want to point out that, the, that this system does support functors. So what do I mean by a functor? So for example, one of my favorite functors is the mapping from a topological space to its fundamental group. I took topology from Munkers a long time ago. And in, in one of the first classes, he said, look, the whole point of this is to define properties of topological spaces that will allow us to distinguish uh, spaces that are not isomorphic. We're interested in the problem of, of classifying topological space manifolds. Um, and we wanna be able to prove that they're not, that they're different. So um, if we can define a, a, a group, an algebraic group that's associated with a topological space and prove that the two groups are different for two topological spaces, it means those spaces are not isomorphic. Now that whole line of argument assumes that if I define a group in terms of a topological space, that if the topological spaces are isomorphic, then they yield isomorphic groups. So that line of argument is sort of assuming this uh, isomorphism congruence property, that if, a well, if I have a well-formed, um, a well-formed specification of a group as a function of a topological space, it's, it can be used to classify the group. The, the topologists call it an invariant. Uh, it's an invariant if it's a property of the, of the isomorphism structure of the topological space. Now, if isomorphism congruence holds for the, the language at this level, which I'm, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to claim, then, um, we can write this lambda term, and this lambda term is going to be fine 
as a predicate, as a, as a function on topological spaces. And if, if we're careful to define top arrow group, instead of defining it to be all random functions, if we define it to just be the well-formed lambda expressions, then we're okay. So we can still have these functor classes as long as they're representing the, the functions representable by lambda expressions. That may have gone by too fast. Cryptomorphism. I took um, a course on category theory, I think, from Giancarlo Rota a long time ago. And he was interested in this, he was very interested in this concept of cryptomorphism. And I was fascinated by it myself as a, as a general mathematical phenomenon. People immediately recognize when two concept definitions are, quote, the same. Um, so for example, a group, a group can be defined as a pair of a set and a group operation such that the inverse is an identity element exist, or it can be defined as a four tuple of a set, a group operation, an identity element, and an inverse operator. And mathematicians recognize that it doesn't matter. Those two definitions both define groups. And uh, Burkhoff and Rhoda introduced this term cryptomorphism for that phenomenon. And this phenomenon is completely ubiquitous in mathematics. And everyone understands when things are, quote, the same. And this is different from isomorphism, right? We're talking about things with different signatures. Um, so uh, in this setting, it, it's nice to have a formal understanding of what this cryptomorphism relationship is. So if we take two classes, sigma and tau, um, I've talked about functors, right? A functor is, is a lambda expression um, in, the, in this, a well-formed lambda expression. So if I have a well-formed lambda expression that maps sigma to tau and another well-formed lambda expression that goes back, and I can show that these are, these are bijections in the sense that each is the inverse of the other, then sigma and tau are cryptomorphic. Now, the importance of cryptomorphism in this talk is that I'm trying to give a complete set of inference rules for isomorphism. Um, and if F is a cryptomorphism from sigma to tau, then because of uh, isomorphism congruence, I'm going to have that U and V are isomorphic at sigma if and only if uh, F of them is isomorphic at tau. So I can shift and I can apply a cryptomorphism and shift the isomorphism question to a different type if they're cryptomorphic. And the paper shows that every class in the entire definable in the system is cryptomorphic to a, to a Bourbaki structure class. And since I have a definition for isomorphism at Bourbaki structure classes that just expresses it as a formula in the base language, this cryptomorphism is going to give me a way to express isomorphism at every class. So now I've got uh, inference rules that let me translate any formula, any isomorphism formula into a formula in the base language that doesn't talk about isomorphism because I can shift it to a structure class and at which, and in this structure class, the question of isomorphism is expressible as a formula. Um, okay. Uh, I think I'm going to have time to just talk about how, to, how we prove isomorphism congruence. Um, we have to do two things. We have to be careful um, to define well-formed contexts. I haven't done that really fully rigorously yet. Um, and we must be careful to define the meaning of isomorphism at all type expressions. Um, so this is the point. Uh, this is the point where I should have talked about Tarski's contribution. So what we're going to do is we're going to define now, um, or at least I'm going to claim there is a definition of uh, these value functions. So the first is that we're going to, uh, uh, for a well-formed context, I'm going to formally define the set of variable interpretations uh, that that context specifies. And for an expression that is well-formed under a context, 
I'm going to formally define the meaning of that expression under a variable interpretation uh, allowed by the context. So we've got these two value functions. What are the variable interpretations defined by a context? What's the value of an expression under that variable interpretation? Um, and I'm going to equate well-formedness with definedness. Um, so in, I'm just going to use those as synonyms. Rather than define what's well-formed, I'm going to define what's defined. And it's going to be well-formed if and only if it's defined. So the value functions are going to be partial. They're only going to be defined on some of the contexts. And those are going to be the contexts that are well-formed. Now, I need to specify, if this was in person, if I was speaking in person, you were all in the same room, I would have hoped for a laugh at this point. But you're all muted, so I can't hear any laughs. But um, you need a clause for every construct of the language. The paper has a clause for every concept of the language. The semantics is transparent enough that I think um, most of you would have no, I could tell you what thing to define and you could define it. Um, just based on the intuitive understanding of that meaning. So here's, a, here's the clause for dependent pair types. Um, so this is a dependent pair type is defined if the type sigma is defined and is defined to be a type. I'm using type here because it could be, in this case, it can be either a class or a set. Um, and we also need that if I extend the context with x being a sigma, then tau of x is defined to be either a class or a set. And in that case, this is defined to be the set of all pairs such that the first one is in sigma and the second one is in um, tau of x, where x is interpreted as the first one. So there's nothing mysterious here. Equality is special. The fundamental issue in getting uh, isomorphism congruence is the constraint on equality. I should have said back when I did this before that this constraint on equality is inherited from Martin Loft type theory. So it's not like I discovered this. This, you know, subscripting, um, this is really inherited from Martin Loft type theory. Um, okay, so the equality is defined. This is going to be defined if the two values can be put in the same set where that set is well-defined. And by put in, I mean, it's necessarily the case under all variable interpretations that this is in that set. And it's necessarily the case under all variable interpretation, this isn't that set. Once it's well-defined, we can take the meaning to just be set theoretic equality. Um, it's defined to be true if they have the same value under the value function and false otherwise. All right, I'm getting short on time. Um, Bijections. We all know that bijections are central to isomorphism. So what I'm going to do now, what I have to do now, is define isomorphism at all types in a way that lets me prove uh, isomorphism congruence. And bijections um, are, are, of course, central to isomorphism. I'm going to define a language, an extension to the language, by introducing this constant um, bijection. Um, and it's important to point out that this extension to the language is not, so I am interested in math zero. Ultimately, I want to, to think about and approach the math zero problem, an, uh, an automated system that just explores mathematics and explores classification. This introduction of the constant bij would not be part of that system. I've already given the inference rules for isomorphism in the base language. The, this linguistic extension is just to prove, it's just being used as a tool in proving the soundness of isomorphism congruence. Okay, so let me try to do this very intuitively just in language, very intuitively. I'm going to introduce the notion of an isomorphism pair. 
it's different. It's a different uh, thing from an ordinary pair. The type system is going to treat it as a kind of atom. So we're going to have these isomorphism pairs that the type system is treating as an atom, no internal structure. But from the outside, the isomorphism pair has a, le has a left interpretation and a right interpretation. And uh, if you consider a bijective set of isomorphism pairs, the type system thinks that's just a set. But that set has a left interpretation as a set and a right interpretation as a set. If I replace each pair by either its left or its right. And if that is a bijective set of pairs, then that bijective set of pairs defines a, a bijection between the left set and the right set. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define another language with a semantics that, that allows these bijective sets. And in that richer language with these bijective sets, we can define isomorphism. Um, so I'm going to skip over this slide. So the new constant bij denotes the class of all sets such that pairs of the form left of x and right of x for x in the set defines a bijection between the left interpretation and the right interpretation of the set. So this is denoting the set, the class of all bijective sets. And the class of all bijective sets to the type system looks just like the class of all sets. It can't, the type system can't tell the difference between a bijective set and a, a set. Um, but the bijective sets have these left and right interpretations. So we have to add, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to add, a, um, we're going to take the old set um, to be the class of all base sets. And what I'm going to mean by a base set is it has no, the left and the right are the same as it, right? So if I had no isomorphism pairs, then the left and right operator don't, doesn't do anything. It doesn't replace any isomorphism pair. Um, but the idea is that this left projection operation now can be applied to an arbitrary object built out of these isomorphism pairs. We also define um, bij to be the class of all bijective sets. This is going to get technical, and I'm almost out of time. So just let me point out this one thing. This is the, this is the rule for um, equality. Equality used to say that if um, U is in a set and V is in a set and it's a set, then, it's, then the equality is well formed. In order to get this to work in the extended language, I have to replace that occurrence of set with bij because the way I set these things up, this is naive sets um, and this is bijective sets. So, so I need this to now work for bijective sets. So this gives you some feeling of, you know, what the bijective sets are doing for you. Um, I'm okay. So here's the definition of isomorphism. Um, okay, we're interested in the situation where I've got two elements of the same class, like these might be two topological spaces. So this is in the base language. So in the base language, I've got two um, topological spaces. I need to define what it means for those two topological spaces to be equal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this type, topological space, and I'm going to replace, but this is completely general, I'm going to replace every occurrence of the constant set in that type expression by the constant bij. So now the sets are allowed to be bijective sets. Okay, so I'm going to have these topological spaces whose point sets are bijective sets. And these topological spaces are going to have two interpretations. A left interpretation where that uh, bijective space is mapped to its left interpretation and a right interpretation where that bijective space is matched to its right, mapped to its right interpretation. And two topological spaces are going to be isomorphic if there exists a topological space over a bijective set whose left interpretation is the first and whose right interpretation is the second. I hope that sort of makes, sort of grabs your intuition as making sense. 
for a definition of isomorphism. Now, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip over proofs, but they're, they're fundamental lemmas. Let me just point out one lemma. A fundamental lemma is that um, if I've got a context that's allowing biject bijective sets, so this is something that's allowed to have a bijective set, and I take its left, the left of the value of the Tarskian value, that's going to be equal to the Tarskian value of u when I'm not allowing bijective sets under the left of the variable interpretation. So left commutes with evaluation. And that's fundamental to proving isomorphism congruence. OK, I just want to say a few words. I feel like I should say a few words about previous treatments of isomorphism in dependent type theory. And I promise to say something about homotopy type theory. So I'm going to get there. Groupoid model, 1995. This was a major, this is a major paper. It, it won a test of time award. Um, the, but in the context of this talk, um, the model can be interpreted as replacing S colon set in my system, in this system, in the set theoretic system, with S colon groupoid. So we're replacing the concept of set with the concept of a groupoid. A groupoid is a category in which every morphism is an isomorphism. And in set theoretic type theory, in the formulation, it is true that the class group does form um, a groupoid under, uh, under the groups and the isomorphisms as defined in the system. So it is true that all of the classes are in some sense, groupoids. But here we start, but, it, but you get that property from the grammatical constraint on set theory, not by baking it in. Here we bake in the idea that every set, that, that, that when you declare a variable, you're declaring it to be a groupoid. Um, so we're replacing S colon set with S colon groupoid. Um, and, and then you have things like, then you have inference rules that say things like, if S is a groupoid, then S arrow S is a groupoid. And you have to define the semantics of this function space as a category, as a groupoid. So um, it's fairly involved. Also, in this groupoid model, it's still inherited, the groupoid model still inherited all of those um, things that to me feel unnatural that, that sort of were historically there from constructivism, like propositions as types. Um, Okay, and I'm going to jump to homotopy type theory and end on this note. Homotopy type theory can be interpreted as replacing X colon set with X colon topological space. So now, um, and it's a, it's a certain kind of topological space, I'm not an algebraic topologist. So I'm a little bit out of my realm here, um, but I do, I, did, I do understand homo, basic homotopy theory in the fundamental group, and I understand what a simplicial set is. Um, and so uh, what we're going to do is this is going to be a topological space definable by a simplicial, by, by a simplicial set. Um, and now you're going to prove something like if S is a topological space, then S arrow S is a topological space. And you have to give the semantics of S arrow S as a topological space. It's going to be, the, it's going to be continuous, I think, continuous maps. And the pair type is interpreted as a fibration. Now I'm a little bit out of my realm. Um, uh, so I think this, you know, attracted people because it turned type theory into this algebraic topology calculus where everything's denoting topological spaces and you've got and the inference rules of Martin Locke type theory were proved to be sound under this simplicial set model. So it gives you a calculus for algebraic topology. Um, I think people have become somewhat disillusioned with the value of this particular calculus as a calculus of topology. Um, but for me, looking at it, under this interpretation, I would have to work really hard 
to even know what these uh, expressions mean. And maybe, you know, I shouldn't be worried about what they mean, but I feel like I need to know the meaning of the notation. And if this is the meaning of the notation, I'm going to have to work really hard uh, to understand it. Um, okay, summary. I'm going to be done. Um, I'm using math zero as a motivation, as a kind of excuse for this. So I'm proposing that math zero um, have a system that has isomorphism baked in. And I'm proposing that um, uh, the classification problem be used as, as a foundation for the objective for math zero. Um, but independent of that motivation, so the point is that syntactic well-formedness well conditions on transparent set theoretic language can guarantee this isomorphism congruence principle. Kevin Buzzard gave a talk at, at, at a conference I was at about a year ago um, where he talked about the mathematician's superpowers. And his example of mathematician's superpowers was the, the tremendous power of isomorphism. Um, you know, we mathematicians really understand isomorphism and naturality and canonicality. And he, he was saying two things are equal if they're naturally isomorphic. And it's nice, and he was saying that's a superpower because that's such a mysterious thing, but, it's, but we can make it not mysterious. Um, and the other thing is simplicity is good, right? We wanna make this transparent and simple, especially if we wanna use it as a foundation um, for something like math zero. So I'm sure the type theorists hate me. Um, you know, the, the um, AI people don't believe in logic anymore. Um, I'm hoping that some mathematicians appreciate it. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, I'm happy to take questions. All right, uh, let's thank David for the very interesting talk. Any questions? All right, I'll start off with one question. Um, so I was a little bit confused about the bytes versus sets. Um, the, um, you know, there you have like, you know, do you need to have both or do you, can you just afford to just have bytes and not sets? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, you can formulate this thing with, with just bytes. The reason um, I wanted a, a formulation, a base language that did not have bytes um, is is to make the base language look like uh, naive set theory. Nothing, you know, nothing out of the ordinary, just completely naive set theory. And if you look at some of the lemmas, oops. If you look at some of the lemmas, what's happening is um, the lemmas involve contexts that mix um, purely set theoretic contexts that are using set with context that are using bytes. And there's something called the functor lemma. Um, here's the functor lemma that if, the functor lemma says that if you've got a functor, right, from assuming X is a topological space, I can prove that E of X is a group. So this sequent can be viewed as a functor. Um, this functor lifts, this, this, is a, this is a function on objects but it lifts to a function on isomorphisms. So this is saying that if this is true, then it's gonna be true that if I take X um, in, in the isomorphism space, it's going to map to E of X in the isomorphism space of tau. So it's saying that the functors carry the morphisms. And to formulate, I, want, I still want the base context here to be talking about just regular sets. Mm -hmm. Any other? Uh, David, I didn't quite understand the program you're suggesting, like uh, the for math zero. So, can you say a little bit more where this fits in? I don't know. So like this uh, classification problem, like so, where do we go with that? Yeah, first let me say I don't really understand it either. Um, but the idea is that um, let's just suppose, for the sake of argument, that I had some notion of simplicity for concepts. Right, this, this, this is giving me some kind of grammar 
for all mathematical concepts. That's what the type system is giving you. And suppose I had some notion of simplicity, some measure of simplicity for the concepts. I'm not saying this is right or perfect. I'm just putting it out there as kind of a baseline. Um, then I could sort of enumerate them by simplicity and, and ask a classification question about each one. You know, classify, classify the finite sets. What I would take to be the, my first objective in, in Math Zero is to get a system that would derive Piano's axioms for the natural numbers from the classification problem for finite sets. Um, but even understanding exactly how the classification problem gives rise to a, a particular structure that is the classification needs some uh, thought. Uh, David? Hi, Mike. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, and we, we, we spoke a little about this and you know, to, to kind of continue on this question. So, uh, I mean, uh, so, so in the sense, sometimes discovering the natural numbers, you know, every set, you know, every structure, you know, like a group, you forget almost all of the structure and you, you count the number of elements in the carrier set and you get the order of the group and uh, you can look at this, uh, you know, you, you, unless you start doing natural things with that, you will start to uh, derive the uh, prop, you know, the arithmetic operations and properties of natural number. But how would you go the other way around? You know, so uh, it, you know, I can I can see leaving out the uh, structure of a group and deciding that it, it is like a set and has a certain number of elements. But how would it, how would the system be motivated to add axioms to uh, ever come up with the group from the uh, set? Do, do you have some picture for that? Is it just a random search or is there, can there be some more directed search? Um, I don't have, I do not have a good answer to that question. Um, you know, in the, in the baseline I just outlined, you would just define some measure of complexity and that measure of complexity would have non-zero measure for every concept. Um, so that's basically a random, a random generation model. But I, but I, but I also said that it, it would just be a simple baseline. Um, yeah, a, a lot of thought. But what does seem true to me is that without, without a type system and, and a proper treatment of isomorphism and cryptomorphism, yeah. you're really lost. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't have a good answer to that, but but this sort of type system seems like a prerequisite. Okay. Any other questions? All right, if there are no more questions, that concludes today's seminar. Let's thank David again for the very interesting talk. <laughs>